Thank you for tuning in today and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, San Raza. And today I'll be talking to Dr. Shir Heber about the latest developments in Israel and Palestine. Dr. Shir Heber is an independent economist, author, and journalist. He's also the military embargo coordinator of the Boycott National Committee of the BDS movement. Shir Heber, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Zane, for having me. Last year in October, you were supposed to hold a lecture at the GEW in Heidelberg in Germany on the topic of child labor in Palestine under Israeli occupation. It was abruptly cancelled. Our channel has grown substantially since we last interviewed you on this topic. And for those who missed this development, can you provide a brief overview of what happened and also update us on the case? Yeah, my case is just one out of many cases of censorship and silencing in Germany, especially when it comes to Palestinian rights. Uh, the uh, GEW, which is the t one of the major teacher unions in Germany, um, refused to give the answer, why, why, to give the reasons why they chose to cancel this event about Palestinian children labor. And um, there was a big scandal about this. Uh, hundreds of people sent protest letters. And uh, there were some uh, newspaper articles as well uh, in your channel, but uh, also on, on the printed news. And uh, the pressure on the GEVE is not uh, letting go, even though it's been a few months already. And in fact, uh, just recently, a member of the GEVE has leaked uh, the secret letter that was written behind my back by uh, Dr. Michel Blume, who is the person in charge of uh, fighting anti-Semitism in the uh, state of Baden-Württemberg, where I live. And he wrote a letter against me. He wrote many such letters against other people as well. Um, and um, based on that letter, they gave him made the decision to cancel the event uh, in the very last minute. They also refused to pay my fee, uh, although they did say that they will pay my fee if I agree to be silenced uh, on this matter and not say anything. Uh, so here I am speaking. <laughs> on, on this matter. Um, so it was leaked because many members of the GEV are not happy with this uh, culture of censorship and, and they do think that the issue of Palestinian ch uh, child labor is an important issue for the GEV and should not be uh, simply silenced. Uh, and um, once I read the, the letter, I think it's very interesting to see. Uh, it, it clarifies a lot why the GEV are so silent about this because the letter uh, um, is very... Uh, indirect. There is no specific call for censorship and there is no specific accusation uh, against me as an anti-Semite. Uh, there is no uh, uh, call also to make this letter secret. So the GEV who do not want to take responsibility for their actions. They want to put it on somebody else. They said, oh, we got this letter, but they didn't uh, agree to, to reveal the contents. Now we know the contents. We know it was their decision. Uh, one last thing I think should be said about this, the GEVE continues to refuse to have any kind of public debate about this or even private debate with me. And uh, as members of the GEVE called Monica uh, Stein, she is the chairwoman of the Baden-Württemberg GEVE, and asked for a meeting, she said, well, okay, I'm willing to meet with GEVE members. Uh, and they said, no, but you also have to meet with Sheer. And then she said, well, I'm willing to meet only with you. And, and that's it. So once again, they're, they're stone, stonewalling, but I think uh, this is not a sustainable thing. The protest is growing. And if uh, uh, the Michel Blume or Monica Stein think that uh, through this kind of politics of censorship, they are going to prevent people from becoming informed about Palestinian rights and demanding equality and justice, uh, they are very mistaken. Talk more about the letter. What were they specifically asking the GEW um, what were the reasons stated to avoid you from holding this speech? I mean, you're talking about child labor in occupied Gaza. And why would this cause such a big uproar? Well, child labor in Palestine in general, I should say, Palestine is a very broad term. Uh, there are Palestinian children who go into Israel in order to work. Uh, and that also counts as Palestinian child labor. Um, it's not just in Gaza. But uh, no, the letter from Blume was very short. Uh, it is mainly, it uses the same formula almost for all of these letters, and it's based on a lie uh, that the BDS movement, the, the Movement for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, he claims uh, is anti-Semitic, uh, and he claims that the government of Baden-Württemberg has authorized him to fight that 
mo this movement, which is uh, surprising. He's supposed to be a German official, not an Israeli official. Uh, but he's working for, for the state of Israel, uh, being paid by the German government. This is very problematic on many levels. And uh, it's also undemocratic in the sense that the European Human Rights Court in Strasbourg has ruled that the BDS movement is not anti-Semitic. And the European Human Rights Court supersedes the policies of the state of Baden-Württemberg. And the decision of this person, this individual, to just say, I'm going to ignore the court's decision and make up my own policy because my opinion is more important than the legal uh, opinion, uh, is very reminiscent to what we're seeing with the populist right-wing governments uh, in in Europe. We have it in, in uh, Poland and in, um, in Hungary, but uh, we certainly have it very strongly in Israel right now. And this minister... Uh, who acts like Israeli propaganda minister with a German salary is actually reflecting the policies of the Israeli government, which is the government can decide to overrule the courts. He decided that he doesn't like the BDS movement, so he's going to write these letters. And uh, uh, I think people like in the GV uh, never even heard about the decision of the human rights uh, court. So, so they believe him. In essence, this um, lecture of yours can be viewed as a criticism of Israeli policy in occupied Palestine. And in my view, this is a political uh, issue. However, they're not being very open about uh, the political suppression that they're undertaking and are guising this as anti-Semitism. Can you approach the courts with freedom of speech and freedom of expression and make your case on those grounds or have you already done that? Anti-Semitism is also political. Let's let's be clear on that. It's all political. My talk was, of course, political. The GAVA is a political organization in their um, a, a statement or in their mission statement. They talk about their belief in justice and democracy. It's a shame they're not implementing their own uh, values. Um, so, of course, it's political. But uh, the German laws don't allow for the right of people to speak for an organization that uh, doesn't agree with that position. So uh, the censorship, it's obviously censorship, but the censorship is not illegal. I cannot go to the court and say uh, that you are not allowed to cancel the event with me because they are allowed. They are, however, obligated to pay me because I've already prepared my lecture, I've written it, I've conducted the study, and I have uh, filed a lawsuit to demand the payment. Uh, it's interesting what kind of uh, responses they gave to the court, why they don't want to uh, pay my fee, uh, which I think shows that they are very uncertain in their position. Uh, but I, I think that the court decision will come soon. But this is, of course, just a step along the way. Uh, the, the, it, we're not talking about a lot of money. We're not talking about something so critical. I'm giving lectures uh, almost every week. Uh, so so it's not uh, such a, it, it's it's a principal issue where, where my only way to get any kind of assistance from the court is over the issue of the payment. Uh, but I think the public pressure and the media pressure is important because it serves other people, especially Palestinians here in Germany, who are constantly getting silenced and constantly getting censored, uh, to, to scandalize this a little bit so that people will not uh, have such an easy finger on the trigger of canceling events. If I may, if I may say so uh, on a personal level, you have a Jewish background. A lot of people in the BDS movement are, have a Jewish background and they're critical about Israel's uh, politics. How ironic is it that in the 21st century, Germany is silencing Jews for being critical of their government? The German government and a lot of German uh, uh, political institutions have decided to shift their support and their sense of responsibility for the Holocaust away from Jews and for the state of Israel instead. They consider the state of Israel to be the representative of the Jewish people. So actual anti-Semitism, which still exists in Germany on many levels and, and physical attacks, uh, verbal attacks against Jews for being Jews are often ignored and not uh, giving a lot of space by the government. But criticism of the state of Israel is called anti-Semitic. And that's simply wrong. The state of Israel does not represent Jews. 
And there are hundreds of Jewish organizations around the world, but also here in Germany, which uh, say not in our name, meaning that no, the state of Israel does not get to um, to speak for the Jewish people and uh, attacking the state of Israel is not an act, anti-Semitic act. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of attack it is. If it's a verbal attack, if it's criticism, or even if it's a violent attack, it, do, it doesn't count as anti-Semitism. Uh, but of course, uh, the BDS movement is very much opposed to all use of violence. That This has to be said very clearly. Um, and, uh, and I think this is now a very interesting moment with the Israeli government, the far right Israeli government, which is now um, evoking a lot of criticism from Jewish organizations who are using the methods and the language of the BDS movement. So uh, there is now a petition of 1,300 Jewish Israeli um, artists and, and academics to the British government saying you have to put sanctions on uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and don't invite him to speak in Britain. And this is clearly an act, they are supporting the boycott movement. And so now these 1,300 Jewish Israeli artists and academics would be considered in Germany to be anti-Semitic. It is absurd, of course. Let us switch gears here and look at another topic that did not get much attention in Germany. In 2018, it was revealed how Cambridge Analytica obtained the personal data of nearly 87 million Facebook users to influence and target voters. This data was sold to governments, political campaigns and even private companies. Some analysts say it played a factor in Donald Trump's 2016 election victory in the US and the Brexit vote in England. Now, Forbidden Stories has revealed that Israeli companies were also involved in this scandal. Could you talk about the involvement of Israeli companies and their activities? Right. Uh, actually, we always knew that there was an Israeli company that provided uh, programming services and information for Cambridge Analytica. It was called Archimedes Group. And the very famous whistleblower, Brittany Kaiser, who spoke about it, she was an employee of uh, Cambridge Analytica. She spoke about this uh, on the investigative committee of the of the Congress. And she mentioned, yes, there is this Israeli company, Archimedes Group. But when they were asking her who exactly was working in this group, uh, can you give us names? Can you give us information? She said, I don't remember anything. Now, that's uh, and she promised I'll get back to you. I'll find out the names and I'll give them to you later. And, uh, and she never did. Now, uh, Forbidden Stories, which is uh, one of the most important investigative journalism organizations in the world, have organized this investigation now into the source of disinformation campaigns. Disinformation campaigns, which mainly you are used to uh, change election results or to influence election results by spreading fake news, by creating avatars, fake avatars, humans that don't really exist, with a stolen picture for one person, with a different name from another person. And these avatars are very reliable, very believable, and they can create stories and create um, uh, uh, waves for, for a fake news um, a story in order to, to change election results. There are companies who sell this. One of those companies doesn't really have a name, so Forbidden Stories called them Jorge's Team because the guy who runs it uh, called himself Jorge. His real name is Tal Hanan. He's an Israeli uh, and a former Israeli military officer. And uh, he sits in the city of Modi'in in, uh, in Israel and uh, operates this company and, and said to the journalist who pretended to be customers, for 6 million euros, I can change the election results for you. Starting from 6 million euros. That's not a lot of money. And that includes hacking into phones, creating those fake avatars to spread fake news and ba basically creating a scandal against the candidate you don't like in order to discredit this candidate and get another one to win. Um, so this is a very, very uh, serious threat to democracy. Tal Hanan then said in the interview with those journalists, oh, you know Brittany Kaiser, the one who spoke about the Archimedes Group for Cambridge Analytica? I'm the one who put her in Cambridge Analytica. Maybe it was an empty boast. But if you believe him, then that really closes that mystery. Who are these Israelis who are involved with Cambridge Analytica? Now we know. Um, it's one company out of several. And uh, the scandal is, is still ongoing. The, one of the biggest French 
TV stations just fired a very important uh, host, TV host, because he spread fake news that he was given by an Israeli company. Now, um, allegedly, he didn't do it uh, maliciously, but rather just uh, uh, in, was incompetent and didn't check that the news that he was receiving was fake and didn't confirm it. Um, but uh, the problem is it remains very difficult to, ch to find the actual culprits, to find those Israeli companies and, and uh, make them accountable for spreading those lies because they use these fake avatars. And once the scandal is exposed, the avatars are deleted. And uh, then the, the traces are gone. It's very difficult to, to find out who created this avatar in the first place. You know, the Facebook profile suddenly disappeared, the Twitter profile, and now uh, you, you cannot find this person anymore. This person never existed in the first place. And um, when uh, Tal Hanan, calling himself Jorge, was asked by these journalists, do you have authorization to do this kind of operation from the Israeli Ministry of Defense? He claimed, no. I don't need any uh, because I don't have a company. I'm not registered anywhere. I'm just doing what I want. But he also said that he's been doing this since 1997. So uh, obviously there was no Facebook then, but uh, but there were other ways uh, to create this information. And if he was operating from the in in Israel for 26 years, the Israeli Ministry of Defense knows exactly what he's doing. This is <laughs> clear that they know and approve it and allow it. And he said, well, we're only going to use this. Uh, oh, 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 I'm, I'm willing to do this in any country in the world except three. There are three countries where I'm not selling this information technology. And that is for the United States, for Russia and for Israel. Um, but there are new discoveries that were just came that just came out now that the Israeli military had itself launched a disinformation campaign using fake avatars, using this very technology against the Israeli public. In, in 2021, there was in May 2021 an invasion or a bombardment campaign against the Gaza Strip. There were uh, riots and pogroms against Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, in the binational cities. And there were the Israeli binational cities, uh, um, a lot of incitement for violence. It was a very, very tense time. And the Israeli military, which was at the time uh, attacking Gaza and even bombed and destroyed a uh, building used by the media, including by Al Jazeera, uh, and, and destroyed it uh, and, and committed several war crimes. But they were very much concerned about the extent of destruction that they are causing because of the legal culpability, because of the problems that it could cause them. So they launched a fake campaign using disinformation targeted at the Israeli public in order to spread the fake news that they are causing more damage in the Gaza Strip than they really are. And that was because they believed that the Israeli public is so bloodthirsty that uh, the, the military had to, to defend itself from accusations that it's been too soft. What they did is that they ass uh, assigned those fake news, those statements, oh, we've just destroyed the neighborhood in Gaza, to uh, Itamar ben -Gvir, one of the most right-wing Israeli politicians. And as if he was spreading it, he didn't. It wasn't his statement. But by assigning it to him, they actually gave him a lot of credibility and popularity and now he is the Minister of National Security. That's one of the dangers of using this disinformation technology because uh, the, you, you uh, deal in, in fake information and if you assign it to somebody, then you are changing the popularity of that person. And, and now, of course, uh, there's no way of taking it back. The Minister of National Security is a far right, uh, a very, very racist, very dangerous person uh, who is now calling for using the maximum possible violence against civilians, uh, against Palestinian civilians. He's also using uh, quite a lot of violence against Israelis if they are not loyal enough to the government. Uh, so this is um, how, how those kind of disinformation campaigns can backfire. It also proves that there is no such thing as saying, oh, we're not selling this, this technology to certain countries. Uh, it's, it's a global technology. It's a global problem. And if there is no accountability, nobody is safe from it. If Iran or Russia were um, using these technologies or even if it was originating from the countries and where the state was not involved, there will be openly uh, outcry about it in the international community. 
How come Israel is allowed to have such companies that openly violate the most fundamental ethics regarding privacy, international law and human rights, and they can do this with impunity on the international stage? It's not, it's not a theoretical question. Iran, Saudi, uh, 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 Iran, Russia, also the United States are engaging in this information campaign. The technology exists and governments are using it. Uh, so, you know, there was a big scandal about uh, the Russia gate, about Russian interference in the U.S. elections, which was blown out of proportion uh, compared to the, to the facts that were known. Uh, but, but I think it cannot be denied that there was some level of interference. Of course, U.S. interference in Russian election was 100 times bigger. Uh, so, but, but that's something that governments do. I'm not saying this is okay. Uh, but there is a difference in the way that the Israelis do it, because there is a difference between what the government does and what the private sector does. And as far as I know, uh, I've checked many different countries and many different uh, examples. The only government that allows private owned companies to sell this technology to the highest bidder just for money, not for strategic uh, purposes, is Israel. That's the problem. That you have these cases of election um, scandals in Nigeria, which, you know, are really just about corruption and not about um, strategic uh, security issues or uh, uh, propaganda, pro-Israeli or anti-Israeli propaganda. It's not the issue there. It's just that one candidate was able to spend a little bit of money to uh, run a campaign, a, a fake news campaign against the other candidate. And this causes tremendous damage to the democratic uh, efforts in, in Nigeria. <laughs> and the Israeli government tolerates it, not because they're trying to destabilize Nigeria. That's not the issue. It's not like, you know, Russia and the United States trying to destabilize, destabilize each other. It's really because the Israeli government knows that there are very many young officers that are retired from the military and need a second career. They're still young and they want to work at something and they become arms dealers. And one of the weapons that they deal with is this disinformation. The government tolerates it because otherwise these people might become um, leaders of the opposition, might uh, criticize the government openly. So it's a sort of political bribe that goes on within, within Israel. And the only way to stop it is international accountability. That means that the international community, international organizations, whether it's the EU, the UN, um, the, the NATO as well, they have to tell the Israeli government that every kind of crime like this will is, is the responsibility of the Israeli government. There will be consequences. There will be um, charges pressed against Israeli politicians that choose not to regulate this technology unless they are able to close these companies internally, which they have no intention of doing. I would like to take a step back and examine a significant international development that took place on March 11th. China brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which would re-establish diplomatic ties between the two countries. Iran and Saudi Arabia are competitors in terms of oil and also have been long-term adversaries in the region, conducting various proxy wars in Yemen, Syria and Lebanon. More meetings are going to be hosted by China in the future, and it was recently also reported that Saudi Arabia invited Iran's President Raisi to visit. What impact does this peace deal have on Israel's role in the region? A tremendous impact. You forgot to mention also that Iran and Saudi Arabia have a very deep theological disagreement because uh, uh, Iran is an officially Shia a Muslim state and Saudi Arabia is a Sunni a Muslim state. Uh, so that's uh, one more reason for these uh, two governments to be at odds with each other. As the world, uh, you know, Ger Germany used to boast that uh, it's a um, soft power kind of diplomacy um, uh, country, that they're very good at uh, promoting and negotiating peace around the world. Uh, but uh, China has really made a, a move here that is so significant for the possibility of peace in the Middle East that we cannot ignore it. You know, as much as I despise the governments of Iran and the governments of Saudi Arabia, very anti-democratic, very violent governments, um, but, but peace between them is so important because it has an impact on everybody. 
Um, it's, it's the civil war in Syria. It's the internal conflict in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Yemen. Yemen, which is one of the bloodiest and most uh, horrible humanitarian catastrophes um, in the form of a, of a war, a proxy war, a civil war. It's many different things. Uh, and now there are some uh, first steps towards prisoner exchange and possible peace talks in Yemen as well, which is very important. But the thing is, the coalition against Iran that was built by the United States, uh, which was headed by Saudi Arabia with the UAE uh, and with uh, other uh, countries there, and, and, you know, because Qatar was not really towing the line quite well enough, and Qatar was willing to have some kind of contact with Iran, then there was a, a, a threat by Saudi Arabia and the UAE against Qatar. And all of these internal um, um, stress was, was built on this idea that, yes, Iran is very powerful. Uh, and all of these Gulf states, they have a lot of money, but they don't have uh, uh, strong armies. They don't have enough soldiers. They cannot really stand up militarily to Iran, but they have Israel. And Israel said, oh, this is what we want. We want normalization. We want the Abrahamic Accords in order to, to, to become integrated in the Middle East, tolerated as this kind of Western colony in the Middle East by these anti-democratic authoritarian regimes, the Gulf uh, uh, regimes, hoping that one day Saudi Arabia will also sign the Abrahamic Accords and finalize those accords. And in exchange, Israel can bring to the table weapons. And this is uh, reflecting U.S. imperial interests in the region. Uh, but now, this, this uh, sudden peace treaty between Iran and Saudi Arabia has taken everybody by surprise. It's very interesting that uh, the Saudis and Iranians are saying, yes, we have been secretly negotiating for a year. But the Israeli intelligence didn't have a clue about it. They, they claim, oh, we knew about it all the time. OK, but <laughs> I don't believe them. Um, and now that this has been uh, announced, the United Arab Emirates uh, declared that they are suspending all arms imports from Israel. So this is tremendous. <laughs> the arms exports are really the heart, the meat of the Abrahamic Accords. Without that, what are the Israeli um, uh, UAE relations really about? It's not like they were at war before and now they're at peace. They were never at war. Uh, so, yes, there's some some tourism. <laughs> a lot of Israelis like to go to Dubai. But uh, but this is not really the issue. The issue is that uh, if the UAE is not buying Israeli weapons anymore, and if they don't need them in Yemen, and if they're not going to use them in Syria, and if Saudi Arabia doesn't need Israeli weapons in order to fight against Iran because there is no war with Iran, then, uh, well, it means a lot for the ability of Iran to overcome sanctions. It means a lot for the ability of Iran to have trade with uh, China, of course. It has tremendous consequences on the war in Ukraine as well. And I think without the war in Ukraine, this um, maneuver would not have been possible. And not that I think war is good, of course, but it is interesting that um, despite how most Western media is talking about the war in Ukraine as a complete failure and, and catastrophe for Russia, on the diplomatic level, Russia is actually gathering more allies, which is unexpected, and, and the U.S. is losing them. So the U.S. is now losing uh, Saudi Arabia because uh, Saudi Arabia is willing to, to normalize relations with Iran. Uh, and Israel has lost its role as the, the fist of U.S. imperialism in the Middle East. And immediately the U.S. told Israel after uh, the si signing that uh, we, we're not going to tolerate your neutrality about Ukraine anymore. Israel has always said, oh, we don't want to take sides in the Ukraine-Russia war. How can you not take sides when, when you're a client state of the United States and receive U.S. Uh, weapons? Well, now uh, the U.S. says, OK, well, that, that's it. Because you don't have this role anymore against Iran, you're, you have to now support Ukraine. And Israel agreed to sell a system to Ukraine, which is an anti-drone system. I think it, it remains to be seen if this anti-drone system can, can do anything, because uh, Israeli weapons have never actually been tested against real armies. They've only been tested against civilians, against Palestinians who are defenseless and cannot really fight back. Uh, so I don't uh, think that the Israeli weapons are going to be a game changer for the Ukraine war at all. But 
This is something, of course, the Israeli government also knows. <laughs> they don't want their weapons to be used in a war where everybody sees that they are actually weapons against civilians and, and useless against the Russian army. Uh, so they didn't want to sell it, but now they have no choice. Um, now the ability of Israel to intervene in Syria is going to be impacted. The ability uh, to, when I say intervene, this is of course whitewashing. I mean to bombard civilians and kill people uh, unilaterally in Syria. That that is going to be impacted. Uh, that is going to be restricted. Uh, so this is this is a, a very good thing. Uh, all all said. Let us now focus on recent developments taking place in Israel and Palestine. 2023 has been quite a violent year in Israel and Palestine. It was recently reported that Israeli forces have killed 84 Palestinians, including dozens of children since the start of the year. Palestinian attacks, on the other hand, have claimed the lives of 14 Israelis. Israeli and Palestinian officials have agreed at a meeting in Egypt to take steps to lower tensions ahead of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. This included an Israeli pledge to stop discussion of any new settlement units for four months. Do you think these agreements mediated by the United States, Egypt and Jordan will help curb the violence? The problem is that the Israeli society and even the political system is so deeply divided right now. The real question is who is in control? Personally, I think that Netanyahu is very much in control, but I think Netanyahu is intentionally creating chaos uh, by pitting different groups against each other. As long as he has these uh, warmongers, racists, uh, far-right uh, agitators who have no experience in, in politics, actually, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to call for more violence and more violence because that's the only thing they know how to do. But Netanyahu is teaching them and giving them some advice on how to be good politicians and how to, to actually promote policy through the bureaucratic structures. At the same time, a very large part of the Israeli public, uh, mainly the liberal Zionists, uh, who, who I, I don't want to call them left, but you know they are considered moderate, they are uh, very much opposed to these far-right uh, insane people and, and trying to, to stop uh, Netanyahu and his new government. But Netanyahu's strategy is not to find compromise, but actually the opposite. He tries to create more and more provocations in order to force the liberal Zionists into just saying, well, in this case, we have no choice but to accept all of his demands and let Netanyahu become ba basically a dictator uh, for life and, and to do whatever he wants uh, in exchange for him con controlling his uh, uh, the, the, these uh, uh, far right racists. Uh, so in this situation, Netanyahu can profit from an escalation of violence. In this situation, Netanyahu knows that um, he can push uh, those provocations further. But it, that's not to say that it's so simple, because the Israeli military itself is divided, and you have. A very large part of the military, which completely supports the far right, which are very violent and very aggressive, they are not functioning as an army anymore. They are functioning like an angry mob. They make up their own missions. They just go around with their guns, shooting everyone they want. They know they're not going to be uh, held accountable. They're not going to get into trouble for killing uh, defenseless civilians. So they're doing that basically on a daily basis, as, as you've just described, um, with, with so much violence especially in the cities of Jenin, in Nablus, uh, also in East Jerusalem, uh, you, you see those raids where where it's not the, the Israeli military command that said we now need a raid. No, it's the soldiers on the spot. Some low ranking officer says, let's go in and, and shoot some people. But there's the other side of the army. The other side of the army are uh, the Air Force, which operates both the um, fighter jets, but also the drones and the intelligence units. And they are essential for the ability of the first or of the other half of the army to act with impunity. As long as this, these brutes, which are acting like an angry mob, have the support of the intelligence units, they can act without any risk to themselves. Because whenever Palestinians will try to defend themselves, uh, the intelligence officers are going to have a drone tell, uh, uh, see the Palestinians coming. They will tell them 
okay, now you have to, to protect yourself, now you have to withdraw, you, uh, and, and so that's how they can act and kill and, and go away before Palestinians have a chance to defend themselves. Now, those intelligence officers are saying, we don't want to play this game. We can see what Netanyahu is doing. We can see how, how this escalation is actually undermining any chance of the state of Israel to, to survive as, as a state which gives su uh, extra rights to Jews. This apartheid system depends on stability. Like any colonial society, you need to have stability and you need to keep the indigenous population in a constant state of fear and paralysis and under control. Netanyahu is pushing those uh, provocations, those right-wing politicians, those uh, they, they are trying to to get the Palestinians um, well, to, to leave basically, and that's not going to happen. So more and more Palestinians are saying, well, in that case, we cannot just wait for this to pass. We have to do something. We have to to up, to rise up. Uh, and when they rise up, then it's not sustainable. The colonial system is become, becomes desta destabilized. And this is very, um, well, in the short term, it's a disaster. A lot of people are, are being killed. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of fear and a lot of suffering. Absolutely. In the long term, I think we need to think about what does it mean for, for this illusion as if the state of Israel is a democracy. Uh, when, when this illusion no longer exists and now the whole world can see, oh, this is an apartheid state, wait, and uh, actually the rights are not the same for everybody. And now for the first time, the state violence is turning also against the Jewish population if they're not loyal enough. Uh, and you can hear um, leftist Israelis accusing the government of being a fascist government. I think that's not correct, but but it's certainly interesting that they're using this accusation of calling Netanyahu a fascist and his uh, ministers fascists. Then it shows they have lost the willingness to operate within the state. They have lost their willingness to be loyal citizens. So the state has lost its, its political uh, norms, its political acceptance, and it's now on the path of either becoming some kind of a totalitarian state uh, or a civil war, but I don't think this is very likely. I think what we really are seeing is actually the cracking of this colonial system, and this is an, a vacuum in which Palestinian groups can move forward and demand equal rights and democracy. So in that sense, I'm actually very hopeful. I don't think that uh, whatever agreement is signed in Egypt or in Amman, uh, in, in Jordan, there was also an agreement. Uh, these things are going to change the course of history. The, the course of history is, is written by the people themselves on the ground. And the people themselves say, well, the status quo that has existed for 75 years is no longer acceptable. And if neither the right or the left accept it, then it's not going to survive. To my last question, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu recently visited Germany to talk with Chancellor Olaf Scholz about Iran's nuclear program, the war in Ukraine, the situation with Palestine, as well as the planned justice reforms in Israel. Regarding the justice reforms, Olaf Scholz voiced strong concerns, whereas Netanyahu assured, and let me quote him here, quote, the accusation that this is a break from democracy is not true. I want to assure you that Israel will stay a liberal democracy, unquote. According to the Tagesschau, Germany's leading primetime news network, around 2,000 people, including many Jews, protested in Berlin against Netanyahu's plans. Tens of thousands are protesting in Israel over many weeks. You just mentioned this, but do you think that these justice reforms will break Israel as the West and the international community have known it for a long time? Uh, absolutely. It will not break Israel as a liberal democracy because Israel has never been a liberal democracy. But the judicial reforms are uh, breaking the illusion. And they're breaking also the kind of agreement or un unspoken agreement that Israel pretends to be a Western state and pretends to be almost part of Europe uh, on par. Uh, it's a member of the OECD, the Organization for uh, um, Developed uh, um, Democracies uh, for Economic Development. These, these um, uh, laws that Netanyahu is promoting as part of the judicial form are part of this provocation. 
they are so unsustainable that uh, that uh, if they pass, there is no no government really. It's not just uh, <laughs> it's it's a very weird situation in which basically whatever the prime minister says is the law. I, I don't think this is a, a very realistic ending to this to this process. But I think Netanyahu went to Germany not in order to hear Scholz's criticism. He went to Germany because he wanted to show the Israelis that, look, I can still do foreign diplomacy because in Germany I'm still accepted and they still roll out the red carpet even if uh, I am uh, breaking all the rules and and doing whatever I want. Uh, Also because he wanted to sell to Scholz the Arrow 3 uh, missile defense system. And the missile defense system Arrow 3 is a scam. Unfortunately, it's uh, um, it's interesting that the CDU, uh, the, the right wing German party, CDU, has actually uh, filed um, a question to parliament with 31 questions. Is really Arrow 3 the best system that we want to have? Is this really, uh, uh, why did you choose this one and not another one? And the CDU is usually even more pro-Israeli than, than the uh, current uh, German government. But, but the Arrow 3 system just doesn't really exist. There is an Arrow 2 system, and uh, the Arrow 3 is still in development, but the Germans are, they want to buy the Arrow 3 now. So the Israelis say, okay, no problem, we'll sell you the Arrow 2, we'll put a sticker on it, it says Arrow 3. But the Arrow 2 uh, has been tested, and not very successfully, and one of the missiles that was tested fell in Syria. And the Syrian government immediately sent it to Russia. So Russia knows exactly how this missile works. They've studied it, investigated it thoroughly, which means if Germany is buying this weapon, maybe it can be useful if Germany decides to go to war against Denmark. I don't know. But <laughs> but against Russia, it's not going to work. Uh, and um, so, so I, that's really what's behind this meeting with Scholz. You also mentioned the protest. I think it was very um, disappointing to see how the, the German media... It, covered those protests with all the Israeli flags, when actually the demonstrators against Netanyahu's visit were not waving Israeli flags, or most of them were not waving Israeli flags. They were not pro-Israelis who just don't like Netanyahu and, and like the opposition. No, they, they uh, believe that Netanyahu represents exactly what the state of Israel stands for. Apartheid, occupation, colonialism, racism, uh, and they don't think that Israeli flags are, are a, a proper way to protest that, but Palestinian flags are a proper way to protest that. Uh, and that kind of protest didn't get enough coverage in the news, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, of course, among those protesters with Palestinian flags, there were a lot of Jews, obviously, <laughs> because because uh, uh, the Jews have every reason to be furious at the Israeli government, which pretends to speak on behalf of all the Jewish people and commit those terrible crimes and therefore expect Jews to uh, Jews in Germany to uh, pay the price for or, or to to bear responsibility or guilt for crimes committed by the Israeli government. Dr. Shirheber, independent journalist, economist and author, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Zane. And thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our alternative channels on Rumble and Telegram. YouTube can shadow ban us or censor us at any time, so we are asking all of our viewers as a precaution to join us on these alternative channels on Rumble and Telegram. And if you're watching this video, be sure to donate. There's an entire team working behind the scenes from camera, light, audio, and in the case of our German videos, transcription, translation, voiceover, video editing. Be sure to donate so we can continue to produce independent and non-profit news and analysis. I'm your host, San Rosa. See you guys next time.